this session we are going to see about treatment of postpartum hemorrhage to give an overview of what are we going to in this see in this session we'll see about the definition of postpartum hemorrhage what are the risk factors for postpartum hemorrhage how to prevent postpartum hemorrhage what are the causes of this disease and how to treat as per each cause so this is what we are going to see in this session so let's first go into the definition of postpartum hemorrhage postpartum hemorrhage is defined as blood loss of more than 500 ml within 24 hours of delivery if the blood loss happens with after 24 hours with 26 weeks it is called as late postpartum hemorrhage or some people call it as secondary postpartum hemorrhage now let us see the what are the risk factors for postpartum hemorrhage and how can we prevent this postpartum hemorrhage now most causes if you look into the case of postpartum hemorrhage do not have any underlying risk factors now three or four factors are considered as risk factors the first is prolonged th third stage of labor multiple delivery fetal macrosomia prolonged Uh, distension of uterus can lead to atony in that way fetal macrosomia and previous history of postpartum hemorrhage or known risk factors for postpartum hemorrhage now what is the implication of this people having this factors of postpartum hemorrhage are advised to undergo uh, their delivery in centers which have measures for resuscitation with blood transfusion right now let's see having told what are the risk factors let's see how to prevent postpartum hemorrhage now postpartum hemorrhage can be prevented by active management of third stage of labor that is said to be important factor in preventing postpartum hemorrhage now what are the measures should be taken for the active management of third stage of labor the first and the most important is prophylactic use of oxytocin this is one of the important preventive measures for postpartum hemorrhage and this can lead to around reduction in more than 50% of the risk uh, people with risk with postpartum hemorrhage can have 50% reduction in their risk now how much oxytocin oxytocin is the drug of choice choice as far as prophylactic uh, management of postpartum hemorrhage goes oxytocin is usually given as intravenous infusion 5 international units to be given as iv infusion one important practical point which each of us should remember is that oxytocin should never be given as a rapid iv bolus or undiluted solution rapidly should never be injected if we inject two things can happen there will be rapid hypotension and the patient can also go in for arrhythmia so these are the two important uh, dangerous effect which can happen with the intravenous use of Uh, bolus rapid injection of oxytocin and for these two reasons it should be avoided so first that is the most important measure as far well as prophylaxis goes the second measure as far well as active management of third stage of labor goes is the cord clamping so we say cord clamping is advised now what is this delayed cord clamping early cord clamping is clamping the cord within 1 minute after the delivery so this delay is with around 1 to 3 minutes after delivery is called as delay cord clamping and these two are advised as prophylactic measures for reduction of for prevention of postpartum hemorrhage two more measures which are uh, not recommended is what is called as controlled cord traction cct controlled cord traction and uterine massage or the fundal massage is not advised routinely now these two measures are not advised routinely now 
but these two are advised for prevention of postpartum trauma. Right. So this is about prevention of postpartum trauma. Right. Before we go on to the treatment of, so we have seen the prevention aspect. Now let us see what is the cause for postpartum hemorrhage and how to treat this postpartum hemorrhage. Now coming to the cause, it can be easily remembered by a simple mnemonic. The cause goes by four T's. The first T is tone. The second T is trauma. The third T is tissue. And the fourth T is thrombin. Now let's see one by one what is the cause for each T. Uterine atony. This is the most important and the most common cause as far as postpartum hemorrhage goes. It accounts for 70% of cases of postpartum hemorrhage. Trauma can include lacerations, hematoma, uterine rupture. This accounts for around 20%. Tissue retained products of conception, invasive placenta, this accounts for around 9 to 10% or less than that. And the last thrombin that is coagulopathies. This accounts for 1% or less than 1% of the cases of postpartum hemorrhage. So as we can see, the most important cause as far as postpartum hemorrhage goes is uterine atony, which accounts for 70% of the cases of postpartum hemorrhage. Now, let's go, having said what is the cause for postpartum hemorrhage, now let's go into what is the treatment of postpartum hemorrhage. Before we go on to the treatment, there is a dictum for treatment of postpartum hemorrhage. The dictum is that postpartum hemorrhage is not a disease. It is a sign. So every measure should be taken to find out what is the cause and treat accordingly. Treatment also goes by what according to the cause. So please remember the dictum that it is, it is a sign and not a disease per se. Right. Now let's go into each cause and see what is the treatment. So the first cause, uterine atony. Now the initial resuscitative measures is common for any type and let's see that first. Now the resuscitative measures. include the IV fluids if it is if the estimated blood loss is around 500 to 1 liters if it is more than 1 liter or 1.5 liters then we have to give blood transfusion please remember that many hospitals have a policy that blood transfusion is indicated for people less than a hemoglobin level of 7 grams but in cases of postpartum hemorrhage or estimated blood loss is more than 1000 ml and there is evidence of ongoing blood loss we need not wait for the investigation the blood level hemoglobin level to come we can directly start blood transfusion so IV fluids blood transfusion are the important resuscitative measures we can give oxygen high flow oxygen 10 liters to 15 liters per minute of high flow oxygen can be given. So these are the initial resuscitative measures which have to be taken. This is common for any type. Now let's go to the pharmacotherapy or the pharmacotherapeutic way of how to deal with postpartum hemorrhage especially as far as uterine atony goes. Now the drug of choice 
for treatment of postpartum hemorrhage is also oxytocin. We have already seen that for prevention also it is the drug of choice. Now how much oxytocin should be given for treatment? We saw that in prophylaxis we give 5 international units as infusion. For treatment it is 10 to 40 international units. This dissolving 1 liter of infusion fluid usually ringal lactate or normal saline and this should be infused so what is the rate in which this is infused at a rate of 250 ml per hour to how fast we can give 500 ml per 10 minutes so according to the severity of the hemorrhage we can tailor the speed at which we want to infuse oxytocin infusion. Now, once we start giving pharmacotherapy, what are the parameters which we have to monitor so that we can know the case is improving or not? If you look into the parameters which we need to monitor, first is the pulse rate, the second is the blood pressure, the third is oxygen saturation, the fourth is respiratory rate and the fifth is urine output. These are the five parameters which we need to monitor so that the vital signs are improving or not we can know. Right. So this is the first step to be given. Right. Now, if the patient does not improve, so we give the administered oxytocin, we measure these things, there is no improvement, so what should we do? The second option is, there is another drug called ergometrin. So if oxytocin at the dose mentioned some time back is not giving any improvement then we need to give ergometrin 0.2 milligram intramuscularly there's an important point to note before we administer ergometrin we should make sure that there is no retained the placenta is not retained or any other products of conception is not retained inside the uterus. Now let's see why is this instruction or why is this precaution important? How does the action of ergometrin differ from the action of oxytocin? Now if you look into oxytocin, this contracts, if you look into the fundus, it contracts the fundus of the uterus and if you look into the lower segment of the os, it dilates and if you look into the contractions produced the nature of the contractions they are rhythmic so that's why this is the hormone involved in the progression of labor because it compresses the fundus or contracts the fundus relaxes the os so that the fetus is delivered outside and the contractions are rhythmic. Now let us see what happens with ergometrin. Again, this is also a uterotonic drug which causes contraction of uterus, but there is a difference. It contracts the fundus, yes, it contracts. Here, oxytocin dilates the os, but ergometrin again contracts it. If you look into the type of contraction produced, here it is rhythmic. Here it is dead end. So now here, even though both drugs can cause contraction of uterus, oxytocin is preferred for induction of labor because it facilitates that. Now can you see here, there is contraction of force. That's why it's a very important precautionary measure that before administering ergometrin, we have to make sure that is, there is no retained products of conception, placenta, or other things are delivered, then only we should 
new ergometry. So that's the basis of why we should check that and make sure it is there is no product, retained products of consumption before administering it. This also gives an uh, ratio or the basis why oxytocin can be used for induction of labor whereas ergometrin cannot be used for induction of labor. Right. Now, what, what are the contraindications for use of ergometrin and what should we be cautious about? Now, there, is, there are two contraindications for use of ergometrin. Ergometrin is an alpha agonist and a dopamine agonist. It increases or shoots up the blood pressure. So the first and the most important contraindication is hypertension. Patients with preeclampsia also ergometrin should not be used. Right? Now we saw that 2.2 milligram of intramuscular ergometrin can be given. The action lasts for around 25 to 30 or 40 minutes. We can go up to a maximum of 4 dose with ergometrin. Right. Now we have given ergometrin but still we have made sure that there is no retained products of consumption but still the bleeding is not controlled. Now if you have initially thought the cause is uterine neotonia and you have given 2 uterotonics and there is no response, usually with 2 uterotonics most of the cases will respond. If it does not respond, again you need to check whether is there any uh, other cause, say for example uterine rupture or is there any tissue this thing or is there a hematoma and make sure that uterine neotony is the only cause. You can feel the uh, uterus, you will feel a soft and a boggy mass showing that it has not contracted and uterine atony and all other features are not present if you make sure you can go ahead to give a third drug called as the carboplast. What is this carboplast? Carboplast is a 15 methyl PG F2 alpha, prostaglandin F2 alpha. Now, how much to give? 250 micrograms or 0.25 milligrams. This is given intramuscularly. How, how much is the limit? You can give up to a maximum of 8 times and you can monitor for every 15 minutes and if you, there is no improvement, you can give up to a maximum of 8 times. So means what is the, uh, the maximum dose will be 250 micrograms into 8 which will be 2 milligrams. This is the maximum dose of carboprost. Again, two contraindications or one important contraindication which, which we should give. This is contraindicated in people with bronchial asthma. It can cause bronchospasm and it should not be used in brachial asthma. You can use in patients with hypertension, so, but you need to be cautious. So in people having hypertension, again it can increase the blood pressure. It is not a contraindication for use, but you need to be cautious. So these are the three agents for the pharmacotherapeutic management of postpartum hemorrhage due to uterine atony, which is the commonest cause. Now, if we have done all these things and still the bleeding has not stopped, the patient is having ongoing this thing, what are the other measures which are there for treatment? Now we have two more modalities, the mechanical and surgical. Now during the resuscitation itself, we have, it's better if we put a catheter and empty the bladder. Bladder emptying uh, promotes the contraction of uterus. Right. Now, what are the mechanical methods if the patient has not responded to the pharmacotherapeutic, uh, pharmacotherapeutic management, then we need to go in for mechanical measures like intrauterine tamponade. This can be done with Foley catheter or Sengstate and Blackmore tube or there is a uh, there are a uh, lot of, uh, there is a special intrauterine balloon called as Bakri balloon. So these are some of the things which can be 
inflated can be inserted inflated so that the tampon aid builds up which can reduce the pressure they reduce the bleeding so one is the mechanical measures tampon aid again if you have not uh, catheterized bladder emptying should be done catheterization of the bladder this helps in the uh, contraction and uh, assessment of the patient also right so about the the mechanical this thing still tamponade does not correct postpartum hemorrhage the last resort for treatment of uterine atrony is surgical we have uh, compression suturing called as b link compression sutures can be done we can ligate the uterine artery ligation can be done surgically we can angiographically embolize the vessel so embolization can be done and finally if nothing works the last resort will be hysterectomy so these are the surgical methods which can be used if the mechanical methods like the balloon tamponade does not work so this is about the treatment of uterine atony as a cause for postpartum hemorrhage which is the most commonest cause also now let's see what are the other causes the second t first is tone the second t is trauma this accounts for nearly around 20% of cases there can be laceration laceration of the cervical laceration can be a cause or it can be a vulvo vaginal laceration these are the two uh, lacerations which can lead to, to continued bleeding there can be hematoma that can also be uterine rupture now how to deal with this if there is a uh, laceration again we need to uh, see what is the tear or what is the laceration and it needs to be sutured if there is a rupture of uterus again we need to we can do a repair of the rupture if it is very big or beyond repair we need to do in a do a hysterectomy hematoma again we have to if we do a physical examination of the patient and if there is a hematoma especially more than 3 cm all it needs to be removed manually so this this is what are the causes as far as trauma goes and how we have to manage now the third t is tissue tissue again products of retained products of conception or invasive placenta can happen so how are we going to manage if tissue is the cause say for example among the retained products of conception retained placenta is the most commonest cause and let's see how can we manage this by definition retained placenta is placenta which is not expelled within 30 minutes of the delivery is called as retained placenta again we can do a manual removal by injecting 5 uh, units oxytocin drip and we can uh, do a manual removal with our hand or we can do a blunt dissection with a forceps and then it can also be removed in that way but if we are not able to remove then we have to consider sometimes we can give mild analgesics and then try removing also now if it cannot be removed then we need to consider the possibility of the cause being invasive placenta again this can be of three types depending upon the degree or the depth of invasion it can be <coughs> there are three types one is the uh, first one is placenta accreta a for a why this is called accreta because here the placenta is 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 adhered 
to the myometrium. That's why it's called as placenta accreta. The second type is placenta increta. So here it invades. So here this is the type which invades the myometrium. The third type is placenta accreta. Here <coughs> it penetrates the myometrium into the serosa. So these are the three types of invasive placenta according to the degree of invasion. Now how to treat this invasive placenta? Many people advise conservative management with methotrexate. And the definitive management is hysterectomy. One more practical point as far as whenever we are going to do a manual removal of the retained placenta, we have to administer a single dose of antibiotic also for the prophylaxis of infection. That also should be either intravenous uh, uh, ampicillin or first generation cephalosporin can be used for the prophylaxis. So that's about tissue as a pass. Now the last T is what is called as thrombin. This is the least common cause as far as postpartum hemorrhage goes. The patient can have coagulopathies he can also have sometimes what is called as health syndrome, hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes and low platelets or it can be BIC. If coagulopathy is the cause, we would have known it previously. The treatment will be uh, the clotting factors, administration of the clotting factors is the treatment for that. And if it is DAC, again we have to see whether it is in, a, in which form of it and we have to again can infuse uh, blood and clotting factors and see that. So this is the least common cause and we can manage it by giving the required clotting factor which is deficient in that particular case. Common causes could be one Willebrand's disease or hemophilia or the common cause for the fourth T, the traumin as far as postpartum hemorrhage goes. So that's the four different causes for postpartum hemorrhage and how we will manage individual cause. So now to summarize what have we seen in this session, postpartum hemorrhage is defined as loss of more than 500 ml of blood within the 24 hours of delivery. Prevention is by active management of third stage of labor with prophylactic use of oxytocin and delayed cord clamping. As far as cause goes, it is 4T, tone, trauma, tissue, thrombin. Uterine neurotonomy being the commonest cause account for around 70% of postpartum hemorrhage. The initial respiratory measures are common with IV fluids, uh, high flow oxygen and blood transfusion if there is more blood loss. The pharmacotherapeutic measures Oxytocin is the drug of choice, 10 to 40 international units given as IV infusion. The second line of drugs and the third line of drugs are ergometrin 0.2 mg and carbopras 250 micrograms can be given up to 8 times. If the pharmacotherapeutic measures fail, we need to go in for mechanical methods like intrauterine tamponade with Foley or Sensation, uh, Blackmore catheter or the uh, Bakri balloons. If this also fails, the last resort is surgical management. We have compression trusers, we have artery ligation, embolization, and finally hysterectomy as the result. So that's about the tone. Secondly, about trauma, if there is uterine laceration, vulvovaginal lacerations, or cervical lacerations or rupture, we have to repair the rupture or suture it and repair, do the repair work. Or hysterectomy, if repair cannot be done for rupture, then again hysterectomy can be done. As far as 
tissue goes again manual uh, manual uh, removal of retained placenta should be done with analgesia or it can be done with the tater also and uh, if it is invasive placenta is the cause it's a very rare cause if it is the cause again conservative management with methotrexate or the definitive management being hysterectomy if thrombin is the cause again it can be von willebrand factor or deficiency or hemophilia the concerned deficiency factor clotting factor should be uh, transfused so that the uh, deficiency is taken care of so this is in whole as the treatment of postpartum hemorrhage and i will end with the dictum of the disease saying that postpartum hemorrhage is not a disease it is a sign and we have to find out the cause and treat accordingly that's all thank you very much bye